Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dog. I'm Hojuana and today we're looking at the very bones of spacecraft, their structures. For all spacecraft, a vital part here is transferring the thrust from the engines to the rest of the ship. And for those operating under realistic physics, it becomes the most important structural element. This thrust structure is the piece that the engines directly push on, and as such it's got to be chunky and strong, able to take the load from the engines and transfer it evenly to the strongest parts of the craft above it. Depending on the style of vehicle, those strongest parts may be the walls of the propellant tank, or some Something more substantial like a vertical extension of that thrust structure going the full length of the vehicle. Then other components like the propellant tanks, habitation sections and external hull can be hooked onto that spine. This is kind of like a hybrid of a building and a ship, which I'll get into the details of in a moment. And that's because today's video has been sponsored by Prosperous Universe, a massively multiplayer online space trading simulation that you can play for free in your web browser. Start running a space company where you can set up raw material production, or find profitable trade routes, or dabble in stocks, currencies and commodities. Find your own niche to exploit in the single, persistent online world, where everything is player driven. All of the tradable materials are made, purchased or sold from or to other players, as are the cargo vessels used to ship it all around. Engage in meta gameplay and get into player alliances that support each other, or get into trade wars to corner a market. You can play at your own pace with with no pressure to log on every day and free players can enjoy the game for as long as they want. If you really love the game and want more out of it, then the Pro License subscription is available. So if you're the sort of person who enjoys optimising production, problem solving or just seeing a line go up, then try out Prosperous Universe today at the links below in the description and pinned comment. Having the structural load taken by the skin of the craft is referred to as a monocoque fuselage, which is a bit like a bug's exoskeleton. Outside of things like small, lightweight aircraft, this type of structure is rarely seen because it's simply not suitable for many applications. For rockets specifically, you can go even lower on the mass to the point where the tanks themselves aren't really all that strong, and it's the pressure within them that provides structure. This is essentially just a balloon, and so without that pressure, the structure collapses. If you add on extra strengthening parts, but still use the skin as part of the structure, you get a semi-monocoque fuselage, which is how most aircraft are built. The first part of this is something called formers, which are spaced down the length of the craft and define the shape of its hull. These are then connected together with stringers to make one piece, and the skin goes on the outside to add to the strength of the structure. An important thing to note here is that you very often see these formers and stringers being full of circular cutouts which reduce weight without compromising structural strength. Modern rockets use a sort of advanced version of this style of semi-monocoque structure, where their propellant tanks still act as the structure itself, but they are reinforced on the inside by isogrids or orthogrids, which act as a whole vast network of stringers to stiffen the structure. These are an even better solution for lightweight but strong objects, and as such are used for all sorts of space-related things, including capsules and habitation modules for space stations. The downside is that all this performance doesn't come cheap, so that's why it's not used more widely. Regular formers, stringers and skin are just far easier and cheaper to manufacture. And that's also sort of how ships are built. Older vessels were built kind of like a skeleton, with a strong keel acting as the ship's backbone, with frames being a ribcage along it. Then beams get run across the frames and decks placed on them, and a skin added outside to add more strength, and to keep the water out, because water inside a ship is bad. Modern designs have fewer of those big heavy frames, but instead have a great many stringers linking them together. In some ways, this big network of stringers and frames is kind of like an ortho grid, all held securely in place by the skin outside, and often inside as well, since double hulls are a common feature, because again, water inside a ship is bad. That's how ships and aircraft and current spacecraft are made, but what about future spacecraft? Well, they might make use of something that we use currently for bridges tension. Cable stayed and suspension bridges can go further between spans with less material because they hang on cables rather than sitting atop massive compressive structures. The exact same logic can apply to spacecraft too, saving a huge amount of mass. 
The best example of this is of course the ISVs in Avatar, with their massive interstellar grade antimatter engine sections at the front, or top, and a big long cable carrying the payload way behind, or below it. So why not just attach the payload directly? Well, all the horrible radiation that the engines are chucking out would turn the passengers and crew into soup, so they're moved further away to mitigate that. If you tried to do that with a compressive structure on the top, it would have been huge and heavy, needing more propellant to go between stars, which would have been heavier, needing more stars, which would have been heavier, heavy, needing more propellant to go between stars. You see a lot of this way of thinking when you get into the realm of realistic interstellar craft. Super long, super noodly designs with crazy engines at the ends that are so unlike what we see in other places. These designs are like this because they're right on the bleeding edge of performance and need to save every single gram of mass, and that's only really possible with tensile structures. One thing to consider is that you do need to keep them tensioned, otherwise you might end up with some very expensive spaghetti when doing manoeuvres. But tensegrity can aid with that, integrating normal compressive components into to the overall structure. Speaking of rigidity, you actually want to avoid having a completely rigid structure. For one, that's basically impossible, and two, the flex it does have means it can absorb some stresses instead of snapping. For ocean going vessels, that's important because of waves, and you can see it in action in this clip looking down the length of a ship. For aircraft, it's similar, but spacecraft obviously don't have to contend with wind or waves, just their own thrusters which are probably not going to be able to bend the ship to the point of breaking. Instead, the sources of stress depend more on what the ship is meant to do. If it's capable of landing on planets or docking at centrifuge stations, then its structure needs to be able to take that load. Ideally, this would be perfectly aligned with the main engines, but perhaps it barely lands or even hangs from its nose. The other big source of structural stress is weapon impacts. Admittedly, this does depend on the weapons in the setting, but sometimes hits may be so powerful that if a vessel isn't designed for it, it'll just fall to pieces. This was sort of the case with Cold War vessels that faced the prospect of being hit by nuclear weapons, and thus had more of their strength in heavy framing than their skin. This idea specifically doesn't quite translate to space combat because nukes work differently there because there's no shockwaves, but it's still something interesting to consider. There's also a number of compromises to consider, such as the structural elements inside a ship might very well go right through crew spaces and such, just like on the Pillar of Autumn in Halo. The opposite of this is where particularly large components might cause structural compromises due to their sheer size. Take turret number one on the Iowa class battleships where the tapering of the hull around the huge cutout for the turret barbette means there's a bit of a structural weakness. Other compromises might come from the production method, as I mentioned earlier with the ISO and ortho grid methods, which are far more costly than inferior options. Related to this is the method of construction, and how that influences both the structure and other components. For example, steel ships used to be built up from the keel similar to buildings on their foundations, but these days they're put together out of huge prefabricated sections. In sci-fi there may be vast 3D printers that can create all sorts of incredibly complex but very strong structures that would be impossible to create using traditional construction methods. Taking this to its logical extreme, we get the industrial replicators of Star Trek, able to generate whole segments of spacecraft right down to the atomic level. The very last thing to mention is that Star Trek has a whole extra thing for ship structures, the structural integrity field. This is a specialised force field that seems to absorb the stresses a structure might encounter from warp travel and being shot at and stuff, taking the burden at least until it runs out of power. It seems logical to me that an extension of this tech is how the 32nd century ships keep their disconnected parts held together. So there's plenty of options out there for spacecraft structures, and plenty of references and inspirations out there for all of them, in real vehicles and buildings. But there's no single best choice. There's a lot of contributing factors like tech level, cost, size, and what the craft is meant to do that all need to be considered. You can support Space Talk by joining our Patreon, where you can get our frigate and space fighter design reference books. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.